So welcome to the last session of the conference. Um, in this session, the question that uh, presenters will try to answer is how do risks associated with COVID-19 affect people's behavior in the global south? So you have wonderful papers from uh, Indonesia, for example, and in Peru. And then you have two different sets of uh, presenters. The first one is uh, other ones doing experiments which measure actual and observed behavior. And then you have the standard surveys where uh, respondents state their preference and uh, how they react to risk associated to COVID-19. So I hope to start with uh, Magat, uh, who will present a precarity and uh, redistribution. It's a survey, I, I believe. So, Hi, my name is Janika Magat, and today I'm going to present shared work on precarity and preferences for redistribution in weak states. Um, in particular, we provide evidence from the Philippines. There had always been um, a puzzle in the political economy of redistribution with regard to the different um, implications and results in in studies in the developed world and in the developing world. In particular, while studies in advanced industrialized nations show that labor market risk is related to social policy preferences um, divide, in particular, low risk um, workers tend to favor um, employment based social insurance like pensions, whereas high risk workers um, prefer non contributory and um, needs-based social assistance, this link is not present in the developing um, context. Similarly, while risk is predicted to increase support for redistribution in the developed um, context, we don't see this relationship in the developing world as well. So part of the reason for that is precarity is um, proxied by labor market status. In particular, the formal sector is considered low risk and therefore not precarious because of its high levels of employment protection and secure benefits. And the informal sector is high risk and precarious because they lack social protection and they lack um, secure social benefits. But informal is not always precarious, especially in the developing country context. So think about um, independent contractors. They're formal because they pay their taxes, but they're also precarious because they have short-term contracts and they have to look for um, contracts every so often. Meanwhile, your um, stores, like this is what we call a sari sari store, it's informal, they're not registered um, with the state, they do not pay taxes, but they're also not precarious because they have a um, loyal customer base, they have um, relatively high incomes, or high revenue, and they even have um, large uh, connections with formal firms that deliver goods and services to them for distribution. So we show, we show in this paper that precarity is actually distinct from formality because formality is essentially defined by state rules and regulation, whether work is registered with the state or not, whereas precarity is based on employment conditions, whether work is uncertain, unstable, and insecure. So now that we fix the definition of precarity, we want to understand what really is the effect of this precarious condition on preferences for redistribution. Um, so first, we want to see whether precarity actually does lead to social policy divide, in particular, whether precarity leads to less support for social insurance or more support for um, social assistance. And if precarity leads to preference for more redistribution. So in order to answer this, we did an online survey of 1,500 individuals in Metro Manila, um, Philippines, which is 17 contiguous cities and accounts for 40% of the country's GDP. It also has almost 20 million people. Um, respondents were recruited through Facebook ads and they were offered um, some compensation upon the completion of survey. What is interesting is that since we cannot experimentally randomize precarity, we leverage the current pandemic as a shock to precarity uh, with the idea that people who are 
more aware or um, are affected by COVID are more likely to say that they are um, precarious. So because um, we are not, uh, there's imperfect compliance in the sense that people who receive the prime may not necessarily say they're precarious and people who have not received the prime can also be precarious. We use a two-stage least-squared approach with COVID prime as the instrument. So we estimate these models and our um, uh, estimate uh, par parameter of interest rather is beta one. So we find that precarity actually leads to preference divide. The more precarious you are, the less likely you are to support um, social insurance but it does not have an effect on preferences for redistribution. And that's partly because there's an expectations gap. Um, in developing countries with truncated welfare state, um, people do not actually expect to benefit from redistributive policies. So even if they prefer one policy over the other, they're not likely to demand um, policy changes. And this effect is moderated by informality in the sense that because informal um, workers are excluded from social insurance because they do not make traditional contributions, precarity does not really have an effect on their demand for such policy because um, regardless of precarity, they should just always, um, or at least be indifferent um, with social assistance. So we show that precarity is distinct from formality and that preferences do change in response to shifts and risks in the developing country context, as long as we measure precarity properly. Um, and contra expectations, formal workers do prefer non-contributory social assistance as when they are precarious and that informality dampens the effect of precarity on redistributive preferences. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Now I turn to uh, Belinda. Okay, thank you very much, Clarice, and everyone. Let me share my slides very quickly, and then I will set my timer for five minutes. Sharing slides. Melinda will present something on interventions and communication tools and mental health. So. Okay, thank you. Can everyone see my slides, Clarice? Yes. Okay, awesome. All right, so five minutes, let me go. So this is joint work with my co-author, uh, Francis Anand at Georgia State. And we really start out with this puzzle saying, look, you know, we're in a pandemic. During the pandemic, there's been a lot of uh, interventions regarding lockdown. And kind of imagine when you are in lockdown, especially, or you're in these emergency situations, you need to communicate with friends and family. You can't do it. You want to make a phone call. You want to use the web. You want to access social media. You know, you have these sudden needs to communicate. Uh, and you have these barriers to communication, especially if you are in a situation where you're on low income uh, and you cannot easily buy, for example, phone credits. So we said, okay. What is the benefit of communication interventions like giving people phone credits uh, you know, for a number of economic outcomes, especially thinking about mental health? Uh, should communication interventions come as kind of one-time large transfers or in many small tranches? Uh, and it's a fact that, again, as a result of COVID, uh, you know, throughout the world, many countries have been passing these communication interventions where, for example, at and gave free 10 gigabytes of data for 60 days, uh, the government of Ghana reduced the community service, uh, communication service tax from 9% to 5%. So all these programs, lots of them have been kind of proliferating throughout the world, and yet there's very poor evidence on the impacts of these programs, uh, these kind of com you know, communication interventions uh, on people's economic outcomes, especially during the pandemic. So what we noticed in Ghana, where we had work ongoing, was that in 2020, right, so when the lockdown hit, if you look at people's purchases, every other household purchase kind of declines during the lockdown in around March 2020, except for these are low income consumers. So except for mobile credits, right? So people were purchasing more of these phone credits, mobile credits, and that was going up again among very, very poor consumers while every other expenditure category was going down. So we said, okay, let's look at this in detail. It seems like people are really valuing these kind of communication credits, these phone credits um, a lot. Uh, and especially, you know, this is a, a context, our context is in Ghana. Um, we have very high mobile cell phone uh, subscription, about 134% in Ghana. So we went into this nationally representative sample and we essentially said, let's do an RCT where we assign people phone credits for free, these low cost, it's very cheap, $7 per person uh, phone credits for free and see how that impacts, especially mental health outcomes. So this is the intervention. So we give people 40 Ghana CDs. This is, our, this is around $7 per person. Uh, we have two treatment arms. So one is a lump sum treatment arm where we say we give you a one-time transfer of the $7 uh, 
uh, in mobile phone credits. So again, these are not cash grants, these are phone credits directly. Um, the other treatment on is installments. So we say we give you two installments of about $3.50 worth of phone credits each. And of course, in the control, nobody receives any phone credit. And, and we partnered with a major telecom company to do this. So what were the outcomes we were interested in? We wanted to understand, again, people are unexpectedly confronted with the need to call, especially during these emergency situations like lockdown, during COVID, or in emergencies more generally. How does that affect their mental health? So we use this a very well-known psychological measure um, in the psych literature called the Kessler Psychological Distress Scale, um, which is a measure of mental distress, right? It asks people things like, in the past seven days, have you felt depressed? Have you felt unable to get up from bed, et cetera? Uh, it's a value that goes between zero and 50. Uh, and if you, are, if you have a value greater than 30, that is a sign of mental distress. We also look at, at domestic violence outcomes. So we basically ask subjects whether or not they have threatened or hit their partner in the past seven days. So our treatment, again, very straightforward. We are doing an RCT. So this is a very straightforward OLS uh, uh, framework. And we are basically controlling uh, for some individual controls using uh, LASSO to, to make sure that we are not doing key hacking. Uh, we, as we do a bunch of nervousness checks for attrition, et cetera. And, and our results are very robust. So these are the results, right? So what we found was that in the treatment arms, where people are getting these phone credits, again, very low cost, this is $7 per person, we saw significant decreases in incidences of mental distress by about 9.8% related to the control. Uh, significant decreases in the incidences of severe mental distress by about 26%. And also very interestingly, a decrease in the incidences of domestic violence where uh, you know, partners threatening to hit their partner or sorry, or threatening their partner more generally fell by about 6.3%. Um, the, the effects were much stronger in the installment arm where people were getting these um, phone credits over time and in the lump sum arm as well. Uh, and we also saw that the effects you know, were concentrating among the extremely poor households, um, individuals in the informal sector, uh, and, and women also experienced slightly better uh, improvements in mental health as well. Um, we also saw, you know, uh, uh, maybe not surprisingly, that people were able to say that, hey, now I can make calls. They, they kind of loosened the, the, their, their kind of communication constraints. They were reported being more able to make calls, being able to, to borrow SOS airtime, seek digital loans, et cetera, as a result of these transfers. So in conclusion, low cost inter communication interventions, very, very low cost, $7 per person, have these very significant effects on mental well-being. And we think that this is something that we should be looking at as a policy perspective uh, going forward, uh, especially since, you know, thinking about the value of ICT uh, uh, for mental health and these economic outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Belinda. It's a very interesting paper. I like the design. Now we go to um, Heal Me, where he's going to present a sort of a field experiment on beneficiary characteristics in a COVID-19 mutual aid platform in Indonesia. Hi, my name is Mashur Hilmi, and I'm going to present my joint project with Jujin Lim from the University of Hong Kong and Yohannes Ekorianto at Nanyang Technological University. This is a project where we embed an experiment on an online giving platform uh, built to provide mutual aid for people affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So as with many countries, Indonesia was hit hard by COVID economy slowed down, a lot of people lost their jobs, lost their income, and the government, while, has, uh, while they have been stepping up their social protection responses, but a lot of gaps remain. And it is this gap that individual donors are trying to provide and step, um, and, and step in. So the main question that we're interested in is that we're interested in what does the altruism decision process look like? And specifically, in this project, we're asking two a more specific question. One is very specific on the impact of the choice set size. We want to see what is its impact on the donor decision making. And we also want to see what kind of characteristics from the beneficiary that attract donation from individual donors. So as I've mentioned, we embed an experiment in the platform uh, where we randomly vary how many beneficiaries are displayed to the potential donors at a time. But other than that, we also uh, the beneficiaries are also randomly selected from the database and we also run an online survey. However, due to the time constraint, I will be focusing on the first um, experiment. So the partner that we, uh, the platform that we're partnering with is called Vajirata. On this platform, workers who are losing their income or losing their jobs can sign up to receive money and 
at the same time, individual donors can come to see the can come to the website and see randomly selected beneficiaries, and they can donate as they like. They can directly send money through e-payment platform. So this might remind you of other websites like GoFundMe or Give Directly, but in our setting, um, the donors actually give directly to the beneficiary or other beneficiary like Kifa, where, but for Kifa, that's a, that's a loan, uh, whereas in our, um, in our setting, it is pure charity transfer. So we randomized the donors to see either three recipients at a time, eight or 10, um, and at the bottom, if they can, they can either refresh to get a fresh set of beneficiaries of the same number, or they can donate to any one of, um, or, or several um, of the beneficiaries that they like. So this is one of the cards that they see. Um, so each beneficiary will get a um, single card. On this card, they will see uh, the beneficiary's name, what are their occupation, their location, some narratives, the link to their social media, the details of their ask, and also the payment channel through which the donor can send the money to uh, the beneficiary. So what do we think um, we will see? Broadly speaking, we think that the donors may face some choice overall. Um, they could also be uh, considering certain groups more favorably, such as people with closer social systems or people in their in-group. Or there might be other considerations, like the amount of money that they ask, or um, whether they've been laid off, or whether they perceive some beneficiaries uh, need or deserve more um, more of their aid more than the others. So what we are estimating is pretty straightforward because it's a randomized experiment. We will regress the donation outcome on a treatment group indicator. So this, um, this is the set size where we set the 10 as the uh, 10 beneficiary at a time as the control group because that's what the website has been running before we introduced this experiment. And then um, the results are presented here. So what they see, uh, what we see is that there are more donors. So when, when we show fewer donation targets, like three at a time compared to 10 at a time, we see more people are donating. Um, and because more people are donating, then we have um, a lot more, uh, then we have a higher um, average donation. This nearly doubles actually. Um, and for each of the donation conditional on the donors themselves donating, we don't see any significant change in terms of the amount that they're donating. So this is roughly um, just a little bit more than um, $10. Why do we see this? We see, uh, to un we see that the donors um, hit more refresh, so donors who see the fewest, they, they hit more refresh, which we think it's indicative of them having a more fine-tuned control of their information set so that they don't get overwhelmed. Um, especially we see that compared to the donors um, who see three beneficiaries at a time compared to 10 beneficiaries at a time. Um, but overall, we don't see um, uh, the total of, of the beneficiaries that they see still far fewer than people who got done the message of 10 beneficiaries at a time. So that's all that I have time for now. I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you for your presentation. Now we turn to uh, Salome Amakwa, who will present her paper on stockpiling and COVID-19 anxiety among African countries. Salome, you may start. Hi, my name is Salomia Wakwa Mensa, and I am a second year PhD student at the Ludio University of Technology in Sweden. So I'm presenting a paper I'm writing with some colleagues entitled Stockpiling and Food Worries, Changing Habits and Choices in the Midst of COVID-19 Pandemic. In summary, this paper investigates the effects of the concern about the lookout spread and economic impact of COVID-19 on the change in the amount of food and necessities bought in 12 sub-Saharan African countries. So we use two waves of survey data by Geopole for these countries, and we use the multinomial logits in um, estimates in our model. We find significant effects of the concern of COVID-19 on the change in packet size and food um, bought. We also find heterogeneous effects across gender group and rural urban divide. 
The concerns of COVID-19 might be promoting stockpiling behavior among those with no food worries. COVID-19 has the potential of affecting all the pillars of food security proposed by the FAO. The control measures put in place to restrict the virus, that is the restriction in movements, causes farm labor shortage, which in turn distracts harvesting, and hence the amount of food that enters the markets. The closure of food markets, like um, schools and restaurants, causes food waste, which is a threat to food worries of vulnerable people, and it also affects the size of food packages that individuals buy. There is also the likelihood of stockpiling. So risk-averse people stockpile to make themselves believe that they can hedge against the risk of shortage, which causes shortage, increased prices, waste on even food distribution, the break in food supply chain. However, it reduces the frequency of shopping and hence limits the COVID-19 exposure rates. So here is the, um, economic, the empirical model that we estimate where the dependent variable is the amount of food and necessities, but X captures the control variables. And the unit of analysis is the individual and not households. The variable COVID concern is defined by the concern about the local spread and concern about the economic impact of COVID-19. This table presents the heterogeneous effects that we find. So the um, COVID spread concern and the economic concern of COVID both have significant impacts on female than male. So the probability of buying smaller packet size and bigger packet size in, re in, in relative to buying the same size both increase when the concern of the local spread of COVID increases. However, among the females, the probability of buying bigger packet size only increases when the, um, the concern of economic impact of COVID-19 increases. Among the rural and, and urban cities, the effects of COVID-19 for both the local spread and economic concern is more significant among rural cities, and they increase the probability of buying smaller packet size in relation to buying the same packet size. This, also, this table also presents the relationship between food worries and the um, concern of COVID-19. So here we see that the concern of COVID-19, which is a spread and economic impact of the virus, has significant impact on those who are not worried about food. And here, the probability of buying more or buying bigger package size here increases significantly among those who are not worried about food. In conclusion, the we, we look at the implications of um, on food supply, welfare of food deprived individuals and future research. So for developed countries, food waste is mostly low at the consumption stage relative to developed countries, but this is usually high at the production level, um, processing and transport stages. In the short term, stockpiling might increase the availability of food for households. However, in the medium to long term, it might cause perpetual food shortage in the economy. This can lead to high prices and increased food worries for deprived homes. Governments can introduce some interventions that can free up resources for especially the vulnerable people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salome. Now we have the last presenter, uh, Alan Sanchez on domestic violence and lockdowns in Peru. So hi everyone, thanks for the opportunity. So this is a study that uh, we did with uh, colleagues from Oxford University um, uh, in Peru. Uh, so uh, as part of a longitudinal study that we have, we have been doing for a while now. Um, so the context is that, um, so we are collecting data as part of the John Lives longitudinal study. And then this study collects data in Peru, Ethiopia, India, and Vietnam. And in 2020, we were planning to go to the field um, uh, for, for a face-to-face -face survey, but obviously we couldn't do it. But we, we had everything ready, including up-to-date uh, contact information of the cohort. And we are basically tracking two cohorts. The younger cohort that was born in 2000, between 2001 and 2002, and the older cohort that was born seven years before that. So it's been 20 years that we have been following these two cohorts with low attrition rates. 
And so we were ready for, for a new visit to the cohort. And so COVID, COVID happened. We changed and we moved to a phone survey approach. We did actually a new, a new survey based on the focus on the COVID. And they, they, one of our, not, I mean, the, the, the survey is actually quite long, but one of the modules, uh, the, the, the idea was to measure whether there had been an increase in domestic violence during the lockdowns in Peru. And one thing to say is that uh, we were actually able to find 90, about 90% 90 of the sample that had a phone number, and actually, which actually represents 80% uh, of the full sample. So there is um, some attrition, but um, it, yeah, it's unavoidable. And the other aspect to mention is that since this is a longitudinal study, we had data from before, including exposure to domestic violence in the past. So you kind of have a, a baseline. And also another thing to say is that the sample, although it's not a, a representative sample, it's a sample that is a random sample of districts in Peru. Uh, it has uh, districts in urban and rural areas in all the regions, uh, well, uh, in all the uh, climatic regions. So it's a, uh, it contains a lot of uh, information, but it, it excludes the 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 five percent the wealthiest districts in the country. So uh, it's a proper sample. You can see, see here as a context, the evolution of the COVID cases uh, last year. So we had, uh, starting from April, uh, from April to end of June, a national lockdown. It was a very st strict st uh, lockdown with state with a stay at home requirement. Um, and then after that, we moved to a regional lockdown, but it was quite, <laughs> Many regions were actually in lockdown during this period, and this was a quite a tough period. Uh, people were not allowed to go out to buy food, medicines, and to work for those economic sectors that were actually uh, had the permission. So we collected the data for this study between August and mid-October, kind of in the middle of the regional lockdowns. And we asked retrospective questions about things that had happened during the lockdown, including domestic violence. But bear in mind that it was actually a long survey so we were not able to ask too many questions about violence. But also in addition to that, it's a sensitive, it's a sensitive thing to ask during the phone, uh, during a phone call, because if something happens and uh, you are not able to actually uh, activate a protocol because uh, you are not even able to move uh, out of your house. So th for this reason and for other uh, ethical reasons, we try to find a different approach to measure uh, the the, the, inc the potential increase in domestic violence. And the way we did this is something is using something called least randomization, which is something that has been used before. Obviously, there is a long literature. And in this case, even uh, in this case, we applied uh, to this uh, specific uh, uh, context. We did it as follow. So you have the sample of people that you are aiming to, to contact. You randomly sample, choose randomly choose a control group and a treatment group. For the to the control group, you basically mention four statements, such as, for instance, uh, during the lockdown, I was able to spend more free time than previously doing exercise, and, and, and so on. So, and you, and out of the four statements, you ask with how many statements you agree with, not with, with with which specifically, but with only with how many. That's it. And then for the treatment group, you ask the same four statements plus a new one, and that one is I was physically hurt more often by someone in my household during the lockdown. So this is actually the key aspect for us. And because the two, the two groups are balanced, we expect that the difference actually gives you the, the actually the, the prevalence of the increase in domestic violence during the lockdown. We did actually a double list design, meaning that the control group, there was another list in which, in which the control group was a treatment group and vice versa. We did a lot of piloting to make sure that there were no floor and ceiling effects. And as a result of that, we found, we found that uh, about 8% of the sample reported that they, there was an increase in domestic violence during the lockdown. We actually when were not able to find any difference by gender. The key difference we found was that those that had uh, reported uh, being uh, victims of domestic violence in the past four years ago, uh, for them, the increase in domestic violence during the lockdown was uh, about 20%. That's uh, one of the main findings. So. That's it. Uh, that's that, that. That's those are the main findings. But also, we think that uh, this provides. Uh, I mean, our contribution is more uh, on two aspects. On the policy side, for Peru, it was actually important to measure the the increase in domestic violence during the lockdown because it was quite a very long lockdown and people didn't have too many ways to actually look for help. 
Um, but also on the methodological on the methodological side, this is also a contribution because it you know you can use this tool to ask about many things uh, do, do, uh, that are sensitive to us during a phone survey. The, the negative, the limitation is that you can only ask about a few things, right? Because of time consideration. The last thing to say is that the, this study, since we submitted, has been actually uh, um, published in the social science, SSM Population Health Journal, so you can actually find more information there. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Alan, for your uh, very nice presentation and well designed paper. So I will start the Q&A and if you have questions, either uh, you type it in the Q&A box in the session tab or uh, you open your video and audience as uh, the presenters themselves. So we have a Stephen Mailu. Stephen, do, do you want to address your question to uh, Salome? And Belinda, or do you want me to read it? Stephen? Okay, I, I'm going to read it. So let's start with Belinda. Stephen Milu asked, do you think that the effect you measured is short term or is it a long lived? So thank you for the question, Stephen. Um, the way we organized the experiment, the first one, the first treatment was a lump sum. So what we're finding is that in the lump sum treatment, the effects are smaller, right? So the, the kind of short answer to your question is that it depends on the nature of the intervention. When you have the repeated treatment, so the, 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 the treatment where we had uh, two installments over time, so this was between September uh, and December of 2020, then you saw that the effects were much stronger and we think last much longer. So the policy response there would be to have repeated installments of these phone credits and not just a lump sum transfer, and then you get these longer term effects. And then we also have from Stephen again to Salome, sample size. How did you sample and why individuals and not households? He said that food is a joint household expense in most sub-Saharan sub -Saharan African countries. So he didn't understand how you measured worry about food, how, how it's measured. So he has two questions. First, I would like you to address the sample size, one. And then the second question, is it individual? why is it individual, not household? And the third question, how do you measure worry about food? So you take your time with those three questions. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you, Steven. So um, concerning the um, the sample size we we focus on individuals and not household because of because we um, sample by phone the text message so Geopool was was the one that um, sent out the questions so the individuals will have to answer and they are not um, answering like they are answering individually and not um, the household and of course it's um, food is a joint household expense. Right, but uh, we are looking at how, like, what the individuals think about it, and also um, food worries. So whether you worried about food or not, um, we measured we measured by um, your resources, whether you have money or like resources to buy food. So if you have the resources to afford food or to buy food, then you are not worried about food. But if you don't have the, the resources, then you are worried about food. I hope I answered your questions enough. So, any other questions, please? Uh, Clarice, I think there is a question for me on the chat. Oh, um, okay. Yes, not on the Q&A, but uh, yes. To so I can, Alan's I can. paper. Okay, rich and timely data, good design and highly relevant paper. I agree, I read your paper in Hoof. But uh, she asked is whether your interviews give insights on what are the factors that drive domestic violence, like uh, factors like unemployment, and whether the intensity of violence is more severe for a given group. And then third question, like Salome, what is the proposed policy intervention for this? So, Alan? 
thank you, Clarissa, and thank you, Sherilyn, for the questions. Um, so we did actually explore heterogeneous, potential heterogeneous effects. Uh, to be honest, we didn't actually pre-register uh, the data analysis, but I can tell you that we were not able to actually find a, a, a specific driver. But but I need to really mention, st to stress that this was actually a national, lo a lo national lockdown. The entire country was in lockdown. Uh, there was also this period of regional lockdowns, but, uh, you know, for almost three months, the entire country was in lockdown. And so it means many people were actually unable to go to work. Um, and actually, there were actually, the, main, the, the, the level of depression and anxiety reached 40% uh, uh, for depression, 30% for anxiety in the entire sample. So uh, everyone was affected in a way. Uh, but the, the main heterogeneous effect is the one that we show that uh, those that were affected by violence in the past were the most affected. That was actually the key, the key finding. Uh, because of what, what I mentioned, we could, because the, the lockdown was very extended, we were not able to actually measure differences because difference were like you were in lockdown either three months or four months. So the marginal month didn't actually make a difference. Maybe there might have been a difference for so for those affected by you know let's say 15 days versus four months. But comparing those affected three months to four months, we couldn't find any difference. And about the proposed policy interventions, well, actually, you know, I have to be honest that our our contribution was mainly on the met on the on the methodological side, but obviously, you know, for us, it was the, the key thing was, you know, how can these people ask, ask for help? Because uh, at that time, uh, the, the we had a system for a help a helpline, but uh, many people were actually saying that it doesn't work when you call, no one answers. So actually more than a specific policy intervention that we proposed, it was like more evidence to, to push on the idea that, you know, these helplines need to scale up and become available for everyone and 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 through, through there also try to influence policy. Thank you, and very nice answers. So, Salome, I have another question for you from Felix Dade. He asks, how does inequality play out in stockpiling and to what extent do households stockpile, do poor households stockpile? Okay, so I realized that I, I forgot to answer about the, um, the sample size on the previous question, so I would answer that if that's okay before I answer Felix's question. Okay, so um, for the sample size, we sample about 400, um, 400 individuals for each of the 12 countries, but um, um, for both round, but for the second round, we had that um, Rwanda and, sorry, Uganda and Tanzania, um, we, we got a sample size lower than that for, for them in the second round. So now to um, Felix's question, inequality in stockpiling, so we see that females stockpile more from, from their um, results that we had. And we can explain it in this way that um, usually it's the women who go out to, to the markets to buy foodstuffs and necessities for their homes. All right. So if anything at all, they would decide that um, I, they would exhibit most of these behaviors, right? Because they are the other ones um, actually buying their, their food. All right, and the other necessities. All right, and for poor households, we see that they do not stockpile because they have food worries. They don't have the resources to buy more. So the results show that they were buying um, smaller packages, or like and and more than the rural, sorry, than more than the urban um, households. So. It's because for, for his first question is because it's women who go out to buy the food and also for poor households, it's because they don't have the resources. OK, so they are worried more about food, so they don't have the um, ability to stockpile. I will actually I have several questions for each one of you because I read all of your papers what I will do is I will just send them by email and then you can get some of my comments because I still have several questions here okay Belinda in one minute how do you deal with the possible hot turn effects it's from Stephen again okay thank you Stephen again 
Uh, so what we do is that the surveys are phone surveys. So thank you for that question. I forgot to mention that. So these are over the phone with the enumerators. Uh, and so we're asking them questions about their mental health. Uh, for domestic violence, we actually going to do two things. So not only is it over the phone, most of the, the sample are head of household. So they're men, about 90%, I think 80 something percent of them are men. And so what we do is we ask them, you know, have you threatened or, or you know, threatened to hit your partner or threatened your partner in any way in the past seven days? So we're asking them their, their, you know, to elicit their domestic violence responses. And so that way we think we can actually put a lower bound on the effect uh, you know, to say, look, you know, you're less likely to admit that you are a perpetrator of domestic violence than you are maybe to admit that you're a victim because of fear, et cetera, there's a literature on this. So those are the two ways where we do this. Thank you. And we have one last question. Maybe I can answer this because I read your papers. Can we say that there is an exaggeration in many studies and research related to to risk associated with pandemic. I think the papers in this session has addressed that. So you have, for example, Alan's paper and using a, a, a randomized list experiment, he was able to properly address potential measurement errors and bias uh, when uh, asking respondents. The, the problem with surveys, for example, is that people sell the report. Yes, they may exaggerate, but you have seen that, for example, uh, Janik's paper, she used a survey experiment, so she can measure the, uh, properly the, the effect of uh, her, uh, her target variable because she used an experimental setting in her survey. So my answer to this question is not necessarily. Yeah, the, uh, the, the results of surveys and experiments in this session are not exaggerated. So, do, you, do you want to add one more? Um, actually, uh, I just have an, an additional question. So when we did our survey experiment, it was during the lockdown in Metro Manila. So you would expect that everyone is aware of COVID and is affected by COVID because they cannot go out, they cannot go to work. And yet we see that our treatment, which was the COVID prime, um, uh, was, uh, was valid in the sense that the control group actually did report lower levels of um, risk and vulnerability compared to the treatment group, which kind of shows that even if COVID was very salient, just priming individuals have actually increased um, their, uh, their and perception. And then I have to risk. ask because of, we weren't able to ask Hilmi on his uh, nice uh, field experiment. Actually, it's a very uh, well-designed work. Uh, uh, I suggest you read it when you have time, but uh, what is nice in that paper is potentially you can see how the donor's identity, say his ethnicity in Indonesia affects his preferences in, uh, uh, in terms of the characteristics of the uh, recipient. In his paper, with his data, he can uh, check whether, for example, donors from uh, outside Jakarta are more Jakarta are more likely to donate to recipients outside Jakarta too. So he is able to see whether there is in-group or out-group preferences in terms of donations related to COVID. It's a wonderful paper. I suggest uh, you 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 check it for yourself because we don't have time anymore. I thank you for this session. So I hope the five of you got the comments that you like, and maybe I will send something when I'm able to clean up my notes. And then I uh, hope you enjoyed the session. We have to go to the very last event at the main stage. Bye-bye. Clarice, bye. -bye. bye.